Good afternoon and thank you for being with us. I'm Lynn Weil, the Director of External Affairs for CSET, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. Today, we'll walk you through some of the features of an exciting new CSET project, the Emerging Technology Observatory, which creates high quality data resources to inform critical decisions on emerging technology issues. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and you experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and a CSET team member will try to help you out. And once the presentations get going, please use the chat to pose your questions to the panelists, who will try to answer them either in real time or during the Q&A portion. And now it's time to turn the mic over to my colleague, Zachary Arnold, the analytic lead for the Emerging Technology Observatory. Zach previously served as a CSET research fellow, publishing widely cited analyses, including AI safety, global technology, investment flows, and trends in high-skilled immigrations. His writing has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, MIT Technology Review, Foreign Affairs, and Leading Law Reviews. Before joining CSET, Zach was an associate at Latham & Watkins, a judicial, judicial clerk on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and a researcher and producer of documentary films. Zach, over to you. Great, thanks Lynn, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today. It's really exciting to be able to um, share this project, you know, this recently launched project that uh, in some ways has been building uh, the whole time CSET has been around. Um, we're gonna talk today about the Emerging Tech Observatory. This is CSET's new platform for data-driven tools, resources, visualizations, data sets on the global emerging tech landscape. Um, as the analytic lead for the project, I'm going to um, sort of lead our discussion. Um, and we're really fortunate to have um, uh, my panel co-panelists, Melissa Flagg and John Verway here um, to talk about uh, their own sort of areas of expertise and how they relate to a few of the tools um, that we'll be describing. And I should say um, at, at the outset, um, we're gonna go uh, fairly quickly, give a high level overview of, of the tools that we're able to offer um, and save hopefully about half of the entire session for Q&A. Um, so please, um, you know, whenever you one occurs to you, please drop questions into the chat. Um, we are collecting them as we go and we'll look forward to getting to as many of them as we can in the back half of the presentation. Um, so in a nutshell, the Emerging Technology Observatory, um, we are um, have been publicly launched for a couple months. Um, we are a new initiative within CSET's fabulous data team. Um, and we are building data resources, not just for CSET analysts, but for you know, others outside CSET um, to help inform critical decisions on emerging technology issues. Um, our thinking, you know, and, and this has been part of the thinking behind CSET since its inception, um, is that open source data, you know, data, whether it's from commercial sources, from the public domain, um, all these data sources are really essential for understanding the global emerging tech landscape. Um, but at the same time, making them useful, um, making them, you know, actually relevant for decision makers, for policy implementers, takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work, a lot of resources. Part of CSET's sort of value proposition from the beginning has been uh, making that investment um, and using what we can get out of it for our own analysis. We're now hoping to put that investment to work for others. Um, you know, we're inquiring, maintaining, enriching, uh, distributing uh, data visualizations, data tools, other resources, um, infrastructure that empowers others. Um, you know, like all of CSET's work, um, the Emerging Technology Observatory resources are free to access. We're building them on a nonprofit basis, you know, philanthropically funded like the rest of CSET. Um, so we're live right now. ETO.tech is our website. I know no one would think of multitasking during this presentation, but in the event you do have a browser window open, uh, please feel free to go ahead and, you know, follow along with the demos or, or just browse. Um, you can also see after the presentation, we have um, support and contact resources on that website. You can contact our team directly. We have live support appointments if you're interested in using these tools in your day-to-day -day work, mailing list, a great blog, all sorts of other um, interesting resources up there. Um, but I'm gonna dive right in. So when we launched um, back in October, we launched with a set of uh, three initial tools. Um, and we're gonna go through a few of them in depth today. Um, again, just to sort of show at a high level what they're capable of. Um, and again, we'd really welcome any feedback or questions, whether it's in the Q&A um, or 
following up directly with me or a number, another member of our team afterward. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the map of science, which is in some ways sort of the largest, most open-ended tool we have. It's one that um, CSET's data team has been working on for, for several years at this point, and whose roots go back much further than that. Um, and we're really proud of it and, and what we think it can do. So the map of science is, is ETO's tool, um, again, based in CSET data team work for exploring global research across topics, sources, and languages. And we are talking a very broad scope. Um, so we're covering the entire world. Um, we've got uh, detailed metadata on, on well over 100 million academic articles. And what the map of science does to make this sort of overwhelming data legible um, is to uh, apply a algorithmically driven citation-based clustering structure to provide a, le a, a legible um, sort of way to interpret the data. So what we do is we group all of these articles into sort of clusters, into aggregations, based solely on the patterns of citation among papers. Um, you know, we see that that often correlates, not always, but, but very frequently correlates with, you know, things that are more intuitive, things like shared topic, shared language, um, institutional similarities between the authors writing these articles. It gives you a way to sort of sort in, in a rigorous and scalable way so that you can begin drawing insight um, from this, you know, honestly huge and very overwhelming, constantly evolving global literature. Um, we like to use this tool to um, sort of pinpoint the fastest growing subfields or sort of sub areas within these much broader topics um, to understand the context around topics that are especially active, you know, see what other clusters are similar or share sort of citation relationships and, and other key features. Um, and in general to, you know, use this as a first pass to try to find entry points for further analysis, for further action. You know, there's all sorts of methodologies people use for sort of trying to interpret the global literature, um, you know, subject matter expertise, keyword searching, you know, browsing proprietary data sets and so on and so forth. We're hoping to sort of provide a good springboard um, to, for, those, for that sort of further research with, you know, a very efficient um, but very powerful user interface. So I'm actually going to, um, share sort of a live demo of how the, the map of science works. And again, going to go through pretty quickly, um, but on our website, you know, we've got blog posts demonstrating all these capabilities and other resources. And again, our team is available if, if any of this piques your interest. The map of science, um, you know, this view we like to call the dots. It's a 2D visualization of all the 100,000 plus clusters in our data set. And what we do is we make these um, this sort of very long list of groupings filterable and sortable in a number of different ways. So let's say, for example, I'm interested in exploring the next big trends in computing hardware. So I can start by you know just fooling around. We have um, kind of a model-driven approach to defining high-level topics out of these clusters. Um, so I'm going to look for computer hardware. Um, we can see that the dots are already becoming fewer. I want to look for groupings of, of research that are, are relatively larger, you know, maybe a little more active. Let's say a minimum of 50 articles in each cluster. I want to look for clusters that are growing pretty fast. Let's say that the top, um, the top quartile of growth. Um, what else? Let, let's stop there, actually. So we've gone, we started about 100,000 uh, article or 100,000 clusters, sort of groupings of research that's sort of densely connected by citations. And with a handful of filters, we've, we've narrowed it down to about 70, right? This is one way to sort of zoom in on, on research that's of interest to whatever particular question you might be bringing to it. You can look, you know, if you like the dots, you can look at the dots. We also have this handy list view that lets you sort of sort and filter by a variety of different columns. And from this view, you know, you can click on any particular cluster to find out a little more about the research that's going on in it. So again, from the bottom up, just from citations, we built a way to very quickly parse the literature. Um, before I get too much into this detail view, I want to introduce um, co-panelists who, who I think will have probably much more interesting things than me to say about what's going on in here. Uh, we're really glad to have uh, Dr. Melissa Flagg here to, um, to discuss the map of science with us. Um, Melissa is a senior advisor at CSET. Uh, she's a PhD chemist. She has had a diverse and distinguished career in and around DC, serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research in other key roles at DOD, at state, other organizations. 
She's also um, a leading advocate of open source data as a tool to unlock and accelerate innovation throughout the United States. So uh, needless to say, we're very glad to have her thoughts um, on how the map of science might be able to help with those sorts of efforts. Um, so Melissa, over to you for a while. How do you see the map being useful in practice? Thanks, Zach. Um, you know that I, I absolutely love this. I think it's really uh, an amazing opportunity for folks to have access to something like this without having to go behind a paywall, without having um, the restrictions that most of us have to just whatever data is at our at our fingertips. I'm really excited to see CSET doing this. Um, from most of my career, I sat on the decision maker side of this, where I was trying to get folks to use data to give me answers on things like, what's the next thing we should be funding? Um, when has an area plateaued? And maybe we need to be backing off on our funding from a basic research. When is something translating to something more applied? When should I be shifting my funding along with that, perhaps to stimulate the next level and a translational pathway for the research? So I think there are a lot of ways that folks who are policymakers and decision makers who are thinking about uh, programmatics, prioritization of research topics, what types of expertise they should be hiring in, um, and sort of what level of maturity the research is at can use tools like this to get a perspective on that. Um, I think maybe with the, the particular map of science tool that folks have at their fingertips right now, there are two ways that I think about using it most frequently. One is where I started, which is what's the next thing? So perhaps, Zach, I think we have a cluster that we talked about. If we want to pull that up, mm -hmm. we can look at the, at, on the side, the actual filters or the statistics that got us there. So I started searching based on um, age of the cluster, of the papers that were in the cluster. So I was looking at clusters that had very young papers, very new papers, because I'm really thinking about what's the edge of the science and technology and what's being done right now. I also looked at things that were growing extremely rapidly, right? So I didn't just go to the 75th percentile, I went all the way to sort of 99th percentile. And this is just what's exploding right now that we can begin to understand kind of this is going to be coming at us very quickly. We may not have been as prepared for it. Uh, we weren't necessarily the creators of it. So I think another thing to look at here is the nations that are sort of the primary drivers of this. So you can see that the growth over time, it's really since 2020, you see that India is a big player, China is a big player, then you see the US and a smattering of other countries. So a lot of this is not being driven internally, it's being driven externally. So we may not have the kind of visibility into it that we would have if we were perhaps the primary driver of that cluster. So again, this is an opportunity to sort of open your aperture to make sure that you understand the things that are coming at you most quickly in that landscape of science that are brand new and help you make decisions on, okay, how much does this matter? Do I need to be a leader in this? If I do, I have a very short window of getting engaged. Is being a fast follower fine? This might be a way to start to look at partnerships, to be able to dig into the actual institutions that are the and, and actual researchers that are perhaps making up the largest um, the largest participants in, say, the Indian uh, contingent here, the 84 articles. We could go down and actually look at the authors, institutions, and funders and think about are these are there places here that we might want to develop partnerships? Um, you can also see that, interestingly, the University of Arkansas at Little Rock is a participant here at a relatively high level. That's probably not on the sort of radar as much as a place like MIT or Harvard might be. So it's also an opportunity to lean in and make sure not only do we understand the international landscape, but also do we understand the domestic landscape and are we being inclusive enough that we can leverage our own capabilities and we're not being surprised. So I would use this tool 
the approach to looking at extreme growth, age of the cluster, and really the makeup of the cluster itself as a way to think about what I'm funding right now and whether I'm leaning into funding, leaning into partnerships, or perhaps leaning into intelligence, right? Depending on what type of organization you sit at. I think another thing that's really important to look at here, and perhaps Zach, you can look at the top articles. So you can look at key concepts and it'll tell you things like IoT, um, maybe it'll say something like vehicles, but when you look at the top articles and you just read the titles, you can start to get a much richer sense of what's going on in this research cluster. And very quickly, we can see that it's at the intersection of the Internet of Things and 5G. And so where did we actually see the vehicles come in? It's not like self-driving cars or something like that, right? It's actually this ad hoc vehicular networking architecture. And you start to see this 5G vanit that pops up along the way. Some of that has to do with transportation and vehicle to vehicle communication, but some of it has to do with kind of a range of other applications as well. What's interesting about citation-based clusters that Zach mentioned, is they're not topic-based. They're based on sort of commonalities and relationships between people citing each other. So what we often see in these is that they have a similarity of the challenge they're trying to solve rather than just a really tight science domain or scientific topic. The nice thing about citations as well versus say keywords is I may only think of keywords that are relatively specific to a domain where that approach is applied. When you start to look at citations and references, what it allows you to do is go outside of the keywords that you know uh, and get into perhaps slightly different jargon that's being used for similar approaches, but in a different domain. This can actually help inform broadening your keyword search as well, which is very helpful. So we, I think I really enjoy using the citation-based cluster approach that we have in the map of science here in combination with other techniques. I think they're very complementary as long as you can understand the value that you take from each of them. Um, there is, I think, one other thing, one other approach and one other real value that you can get from this that I want to just highlight quickly, if that's okay, Zach. Mm -hmm. And that is that they've just put in a beta section. If you scroll down to the connections section and you can see that this can begin to allow you to see not just the growth of the cluster itself, but the actual relationship that it has to other research clusters. What's nice about this is if I step away from something that's really new, if I look at a cluster that perhaps is even plateauing, something like um, deep learning, or in this in this case, right, sort of reinforcement learning, imitation learning, um, what's nice about this is, okay, it may be plateauing itself. What that might say to a lot of people is, well, that's not interesting anymore. We should be putting our money somewhere else. But my question is, just because the growth of the cluster itself is plateauing, what does that tell us about how it's being used in other domains? Because growth can happen in a lot of ways. So as we look at a cluster that's gotten quite large, that may be plateauing a bit, what we want to look at is not only where has it been derived from, so how did it grow from other communities, which is like who that cluster has been citing, but also who are the other people in the universe that are using that research to further their own problems, to tackle their own challenges? And that is actually who is citing back to, right? Who is referencing that cluster, that primary cluster of interest? So if we start to look at who is actually using that. Now you can look at the impact of that research beyond its own little expert network. And in fact, often when you talk to scientists, they're not nearly as aware of the domains that are using their work as they are the work they are using, right? It's not necessarily the literature they're reading. They're not digging into it. They're simply being cited by it. And so when you're actually pulling together a workshop 
or thinking about translational research and the pathways of that, or you're thinking about where that science may come back to actually surprise you through an application, you really need to look at the people using that research, not the researchers themselves or not that cluster itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and I'm I'm really glad, you know, we've got uh, this sort of connections filter. We've got a number of other filters um, at the, the beta level, but this one in particular, I've been fooling around with a lot over the past few weeks. And it is really cool seeing, you know, you have a topic, you know, a very high level topic, reinforcement learning. You can start seeing in these panes like, oh, people are using it for trajectory prediction, maybe, you know, again, these are you'd want to check out these clusters, see what's going under the hood a little bit with their with their own detailed views. But, you know, you can see applications emerging out of the citation network, right? Um, that's really exciting. I think it's a it's a perk of the approach we've taken here. Absolutely. Um, I think one other one other thing that you all have done is adding in the patents is is another aspect of this that helps you think at the more applied level, as the research is being used, you can start to see who else is using it, as well as what patents are actually citing back to it, what patents are using it. And I think this can be really powerful. It also helps you to understand how it's being translated, how it's being applied internationally. And I think this is this one is an actual great example where you see sort of Google and Alphabet, but you also see a lot of Korean, uh, perhaps Japanese, um, and a few uh, British and other sort of companies that are leveraging that work as well. And from a policymaker perspective, this is really interesting to begin to understand the effects of your scientific funding, right? Who is actually benefiting from that funding and who is actually leveraging it? For sure. So I know we th this was all sort of a lightning round on the map of science. And again, um, I see questions come, already coming into the, the chat about sort of different methodological aspects. We're going to get to as many of those as we can. I do want, um, in the meantime, to sort of take a look at another tool that we're uh, very proud of that is uh, a little newer to CSET, um, but has, has launched recently with the ETO platform, and that is our Supply Chain Explorer. Um, this is, uh, so the Supply Chain Explorer tool in general is sort of a a visualization and sort of orienting framework um, around sort of the supply chain for, for, you know, complex technologies, you know, complex supply chains in depth, covering many stages, covering countries. We're trying to make that a little more accessible. And the first sort of industry we've applied that to um, is sort of advanced computer chips. Um, as some of you know, CSET has been sort of doing research, producing white papers, policy recommendations, and so forth. Um, for, for quite some time now on advanced semiconductors. Um, and our supply chain explorer is, is sort of a way to turn that into an accessible orienting resource um, that again is providing you know, data-driven information, um, in, in some cases directly providing data that we hope can be useful in actual decisions. Um, we know that semiconductors in particular are um, you know, really, uh, a space that in uh, for many for many of us at least myself included has become much more prominent in our work very recently um, relatively few true specialists in this field um, a lot of people trying to get up to speed very fast and we're hoping this tool can be a resource for them um, so again i will um, uh, flip through this very quickly um, and again this is live on our website like the rest of the resources uh, chipexplorer.eto.tech in this case um, so the Supply Chain Explorer is basically, you can think of it as kind of like a flow through visualization. Um, we've broken down, and again, based on sort of published CSET research in, in every aspect, we've broken down the supply chain for advanced logic chips into a series of stages. Um, these stages involve you know, different inputs. Um, when we've got it, we have sort of uh, plain English summaries. You know, what is a crystal growing furnace? Not, not something I had heard much about before I started working on this tool, but now I have a better sense from, you know, having spent the time with, with the summaries we've put together. We have information on sort of supplier countries. In this case, Germany is the monopolist, supplier companies involved. And we repeat this again to the extent data is available at every stage in this chain from, you know, starting from design, going all the way down through assembly, packaging and testing. Um, it's a relatively, you know, compared to, for example, the map of science, it's a little more um, sort of high level of a tool, again, with that orienting use case in mind. We have built in the ability to sort of 
slice and dice the supply chain by a few different, um, you know, uh, different characteristics of the stages. You know, you can uh, filter it down and, and quickly visualize all the stages of the supply chain for which um, companies in a particular country have a significant market share, for example. You can do similar sort of operations for supplier companies. You can also look at a glance at relatively more and less concentrated stages in the supply chain, um, stages and processes within those stages, I should say. Um, so again, all of this oriented towards helping you make sense of what is, we know, an immensely complex supply chain, one that in some ways we are, we are oversimplifying for purposes of this tool, but the idea of helping people get a footing in this very complicated area um, pretty quick. And um, I'm glad I get, uh, so actually, John, why don't, we, um, why don't we speak with you? So I'm really glad to have John Berway to, to talk through sort of some of the applications and um, uses of the Supply Chain Explorer. Um, today with us, John has been sort of involved in this tool from, from its early days. Um, John Verway is a consultant to CSET um, and an East Asia National Security Advisor at the Pacific Northwest National Labs. There he works on issues related to export controls, supply chain security, non-proliferation. Uh, he previously served with the U.S. Trade Representative, the International Trade Commission, the Department of Commerce, um, in, in other words, he is certainly a power user for the map of, or for the supply chain explorer tool. We're really glad to have him with us today. John, uh, how would you recommend approaching this tool if you're coming to it for the first time? Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Zach. I think this tool offers something unique and that I'm not aware of other resources presenting, which is the ability to understand choke points for particular technology supply chains within the chip ecosystem. And I think that it is particularly relevant right now because a lot of the interest people are expressing in semiconductors is in the context of supply chain choke points or unanticipated vulnerabilities that people just were not aware of before. And some of the filters that you showed earlier, especially related to market share by country or market share by type of tool or piece of equipment, are particularly valuable. And one thing I wanted to highlight was something that could be a scenario that is timely and relevant to policymakers right now, which is some controls that were instituted about two months ago by the Bureau of Industry and Security, which called out 10 types of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And for a policymaker that is not familiar with the semiconductor industry, they may lack the context to understand why these particular tools were chosen where they are made, what choke points exist, what foreign availability exists. And this tool can actually answer all of those questions for lay users who don't actually need to understand what the tools themselves do and their significance at a technical level. So uh, the example that I thought we could go through is chemical vapor deposition equipment, which as the name implies, deposits chemicals on wafers uh, to keep it very simple and high level. But the controls that were announced a few months ago were on a couple sub-segments of deposition tools. And what, what's really nice about them, this supply chain explorer is it shows not only where the tools fit within the overall semiconductor manufacturing process and what their value proposition is, but also who are the leading supplier countries, who are the notable companies that are supplying. And you can go through and look at basically what the foreign availability worldwide looks like for a particular product, which is very important when understanding uh, potential export control. And interestingly, actually, Zach, while you were doing this, I, I did have another window open and I looked in the map of science to see how the holdings compare. There are actually 42 research clusters affiliated with chemical vapor deposition equipment. And if you use this supply chain tool and correlate it with what is in the map of science, you can then start to see really interesting trends related to market share and patent filings and which companies own patents and citation intensity, which is a, a nice example of how the two tools complement and reinforce each other and kind of gets back to what Melissa was saying earlier, where standalone tools are great and they're helpful, but by combining multiple tools, you end up with a very robust new source of information. And that, that to me is the big value proposition of this tool. Yeah, and I, I think certainly, I mean, my own personal experience, so my, my background is, is nowhere near semiconductors, as I'm sure many of you can empathize with. And 
this tool, even just working on it as, you know, the constant stream of news and new controls and new policies around semiconductors has come through, um, I feel a little better oriented than, than I used to. And certainly for something like chemical vapor deposition, or I know physical vapor deposition was also um, a subject of the recent controls, you get a footing pretty quickly, have an idea of where, where to look at. Um, so yeah, we're really pleased with this tool. Um, there is another, and we're, um, we want to save plenty of time for, for questions. Um, so I won't go into uh, the third of our initial tool suite in detail, but it's really good. So I do want to take a moment to talk about it here. Um, the country activity tracker is basically a sort of high level country, um, country level dashboard for different indicators of, of activity in emerging tech. And for this one, we're specifically looking at artificial intelligence. Um, it's a really cool, very flexible tool. Um, I won't demo it here just in the interest of time, but um, if you go to cat.eto.tech, you can play with it as much as you want. What this, is, this tool does is sort of allow country level comparison of AI research metrics, patenting metrics, investment activity. You can see sort of collaborations and links between countries um, in all of these areas. Um, and one of the really nice things about it, I think, compared to a lot of, you know, somewhat similar stuff out there on the market, is the scope is worldwide, right? So we, um, I think there, there's the fair criticism that we often focus a little too much on the US and China and the rest of the world as kind of like a, a distant memory out there. If you're interested in a particular region, a particular set of countries, um, you know, we have worldwide coverage in our data sets and it comes through in this tool. Um, so you can kind of build your own cohort. You can choose from some pre-mixed ones that we include in there um, and, and go browsing, see what you can find. Um, it's really powerful, especially the, the sort of cross-border collaboration tools. I think a lot of people have been very interested in um, and you know we have gotten some good traction with them to be frank. So I'm going to stop there. I could talk about any of these tools quite a lot longer, um, but I'm gonna leave it off there um, and just remind everyone that all of these tools are live, completely free to access um, and online right now at eto.tech. Um, we have sort of demos, especially on our blog, kind of walkthroughs. We show off different things you can try doing on your own with the tools, um, integrated with the tools themselves, so you can go back and forth. Um, we have very extensive documentation um, and, and a host of support options. We consider our success with this stuff to be whether people are using it, right? We are. Um, you know, a, a policy and action oriented think tank. Um, we're not sort of doing peer review. We're not looking for, you know, any other kind of accolades. We want this tool to be in the hands of users, um, improving decisions and, and making an impact. Um, so your feedback is really more than welcome. Um, that's true both for these resources, which we love to hear, you know, either positive or negative um, experience as, as people dig into them. Um, it's also true for tools we have in the works. You know, we have a variety of topics we're hoping to release new sort of resources on in the next, you know, several months, basically. Um, I've included a few here on the screen, but, but really we are very, very open to uh, input about where we should be prioritizing and, and sort of what the resources would need to look like to become part of your work. Um, you know, several of the existing tools um, and several of the ones we currently have under development really come directly from um, sort of input from users and, and sort of friends of CSED and, and, and others. Um, and we consider that kind of one of our, our superpowers, hopefully, in, in making useful stuff. Um, with that, I think I'll close. Our, my contact information um, is, is there. It is also on the ETO website. Um, and again, thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to be able to share this resource with everyone. Um, and we've now carved out a good bit of time for q and A. Q&A. I've seen the questions um, pouring in even as I'm talking. So I am going to catch up for a moment and maybe start, let's see. So I see a bunch of questions in the Q&A um, about sort of the methodology behind different aspects of the math of science. So updating, whether machine learning is involved. Um, so I'll tackle a few of those up front. I would say, Melissa, John, please feel free to jump in if I say anything that piques your interest or if I get anything wrong. Um, and then, um, but I think we'll move on from there to a few um, sort of more uh, topical questions branching out and we can have a good conversation. And I will try to show my work as I go um, 
to the extent I'm able to, to multitask. So you all might have to bear with me a little bit. Um, but I see several questions. So questions we often get about sort of frequency of updating of the map of science, which are really good questions um, because this is a fire hose. You know, global research is happening quite a lot. Um, and one of the way, one of the key considerations for the map of science as we've developed it is to build a tool that can kind of keep up with that fire hose. Um, I do want to show off, so I will give a, a quick summary of um, sort of our general updating methodology. Um, I do want to point everyone interested in this question um, more in depth to the documentation um, for the map of science, as well as the data sets that feed it, which are separately documented on our website. This goes into the nitty gritty details about um, everything from the algorithms and libraries we're using to um, shortcomings. You know, we talk, we try to be pretty frank about the limitations of these tools, how they're getting maintained. Um, we do this even for um, data sets that are not made public. Um, which is true of the map of science. Uh, the underlying data sets are not public because they involve a lot of commercial data that we're not licensed to share publicly. Um, but we describe what's going on with these data sets and the choices we're making um, because we want to build tools that are trustworthy so that you all will actually use them. Um, in the event something isn't covered in this documentation, again, we are um, this is this is nerd stuff for us. We are more than happy to talk about it one on one. Um, but updating. So the map of science is fed by um, a set of, I believe, six or seven different um, very large data sets. Some of these are commercial, so we're drawing in um, really good data, for example, from uh, Digital Science Dimensions um, and Clarivate. Um, some of them are public domain, so uh, the archive preprint server, papers with code for AI papers, and there's a few others in there. Um, our engineering team has built sort of infrastructure that incorporates all of those data sets into the map on an as available basis. So um, in the sense of the underlying data, you know, the papers going in, um, those are updated as frequently as the, the sort of data sets are. In some cases that's, you know, nearly continuously, daily, weekly, something like that. There's other data sets, for example, our source of um, Chinese, uh, Chinese language only articles um, is updated less frequently, I believe every few months, um, but we are pulling when available, all of that data into the tool. Um, the sort of different enrichments and structurings we do on that are, are updated on a periodic basis, again, depending on what they are. Um, so for example, the overall clustering structure of the map of science, uh, this sort of groupings of clusters into dots um, like this, we update periodically. Um, again, because it is a, a fairly computationally intensive change and changes some of the metadata related to um, that that's displayed through the tool. Um, so I will stop there just so that I don't accidentally make even more mistakes than I probably just did. But again, please do look at the documentation for these tools because we, we go in, you know, in great detail into the frequency of updating. But it is based on sort of technical infrastructure that we have um, sort of put in place and are, are ticking away. Um, we very thankfully do not have to do a lot of manual pulling at this point with, with most aspects of the map. Um, one more sort of uh, technical question that I see uh, here and there in the Q&A that I want to address. Um, so for example, Olaf Groth asked, is this tool driven by machine learning? If not, how do you search and cluster? Um, so the overall clustering approach um, is we use um, sort of, I think, a fairly standard modularity maximizing clustering algorithm called the Leiden algorithm. I don't think that would typically be considered machine learning, um, though it is pretty cool. Um, again, we get into that in the documentation, but, but that clustering um, is sort of determined by that type of algorithm, um, which we've, you know, made some sort of decisions in the different parameters that are, again, described in the documentation. Um, once we have those clusters, we generate a lot of metadata that you saw in that detail view, um, which I'll bring up again real quick, just so people can see what I'm talking about. So. Um, this the the sort of details about each cluster are generated once we have the clusters um, in a variety of ways. Some of them are sort of relatively simple operations over the um, you know over the underlying articles that have gone into the cluster, you know, adding up different citation counts and so forth. We do use machine learning methods in a couple different um, places to to sort of generate this 
um, this metadata. So for example, we have um, uh, this is part of CSET's legacy as sort of an AI specialist organization. We have classifications for um, how many of the articles in a given cluster have to do with AI or different AI subfields. Those are developed using classifiers, um, which again, I'll, I'll refer to you to the documentation for the gory details of all that. Um, key concepts is another sort of, this is a very handy field for sort of figuring out when there is a, a topic in these clusters, what topic might it be? Um, that's a, again, sort of a machine learning approach. Um, but for the most part, we're using um, sort of a, a fairly standard sort of graph algorithm um, to figure out the overall structure. Um, and one nice thing about that, going back to the updating um, topic is we do not need a lot of very manually intensive sort of human interpretation of the entire structure of the map every time we bring in new data. Um, and that's one way we feel this framework is pretty scalable and also pretty rigorous. Um, I'm gonna switch to the supply chain explorer. Um, actually, John, this might be an interesting question for you. So Antonio Cortez asked, Regarding the supply chain explorer, can choke points be parsed by selecting imposed trade sanctions, such as those recently levied against Russia? In other words, can you turn on and turn off the sanctions to see the impact to supply chains? So we don't directly build um, a sanction layer, so to speak, into the tool, but I, I do think the tool is kind of useful for um, getting at these sorts of questions. Could you talk a little bit about just sort of how you use, I mean, not necessarily just the Explorer, but resources like this to kind of figure out the impact of whether it's sanctions, export controls, or so on? Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question and obviously a very relevant potential use case. The way that I would frame it is looking at technology-based controls and entity-based controls in the export control world that relate to semiconductors. So what the tool can show you in terms of technology-based controls is not the export classification control number of the, the tool itself. So there would be a five-digit alphanumeric combination number associated with each of those pieces of equipment that's shown in the supply chain explorer. But the tool doesn't necessarily show that. That, that classification is done by, in the case of the US government, the US Department of Commerce Bureau of Industry and Security. But those lists are public. So what you could do is you could find the export control classification number for advanced photolithography equipment. And then you could take that piece of information and look at the supply chain explorer to see which firms lead in the supply of that particular type of tool. And you could also, as I suggested earlier, look at where research is being done in that field on the map of science and use the findings in the map of science as sort of a way to generate leads and identify other firms that are quote unquote leading in the development of that technology with publication intensity, citation intensity, patent intensity being used as proxies for leadership. Fair enough. Sorry, I'm just watching the, the questions continue to flow in. Um, a lot of technical questions um, related to different aspects of the map of science. I'm going to save some of them for if we have spare time um, or point people to the publications. We have an interesting question, or to the documentation rather. We have an interesting question from Alain Auger. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, can tools like the map of science help with the identification of weak signals of emerging technologies that are characterized by low volume and low growth rates? Um, so. Maybe Melissa, I will talk a little bit about how I would take a pass of the question, but I think thematically it's, it's your territory. So I'll turn it over to you pretty quick. Um, so the map of science is filterable by um, a lot of different things, not, not just volume growth rates, although those are um, ones that I happen to rely on, but this filtering pane over to the left has, has a variety of different um, filters that you can kind of compose to, um, you know, in some cases directly get at the, the subject of your question, in other cases to approximate it. Um, so we have a lot of different ways besides volume and, and growth rate to sort of parse. Um, we do have subjects, which again, I think one, one thing that's worth stressing is um, these subjects are not used to generate the map. They're used to interpret it after we've generated it based on those citation patterns. Um, so in, it's, it's kind of an inference into what might be going on 
Um, and again, this is another one of the aspects of the tool that is machine learning based. It's um, based on uh, some methodologies originally developed by Microsoft, but that we've adapted for this purpose. Um, but this is one way to sort of parse what's going in there. Um, average paper age, country involvement, um, you know, particularly hot topics. Again, we're looking at AI and related fields for a lot of those. You can filter by different aspects of industry and patent involvement. Um, and again, when you go into the list view, you could um, use any or all of those filters to, to sort of parse the, the results you're getting, including, I mean, for example, this is relevant to your question, you can sort in reverse by a lot of these. So um, these are the slowest growing clusters in the map of science, um, the, the poor things, um, slowest in the whole 110,000 or so. But um, so it's, it's fairly customizable in a bunch of different directions. But um, Melissa, maybe at a higher level, like sort of weak signals, um, sort of emerging technologies by different metrics, not just raw growth. Like, what do you see as some directions to go in? And first, hi, Alan. I think we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're my Canadian friend, um, I think you can absolutely do this. What I think is interesting is what Zach was getting at is you might use some of the filters we were using, but reverse others. Like, for instance, you may do really young clusters so seeing them when they're first emerging so do a very young average paper age but keep your growth nice to see you <laughs> keep your growth rate actually very broad so don't filter by growth at all right but look at the clusters that are actually the ones that are really coming up now where the papers are mostly very new um, that can tell you a lot about something that is sort of emerging into a white space. The cluster itself may not be brand new, but if the but if it was small, and then the predominance of papers uh, when it grew suddenly came like very recently, you would see that pop up in that way. Um, I think also it really depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to decide where to spend money that's one thing, right? Because then you want to know sort of wh where do I put the money? If you're trying to convene a group of experts to figure out how nervous should I be about this? How excited should I be about this? This is a great way to find the clusters that are most relevant. But if you're trying to literally find what topic is out there that's new without any sort of filtering or direction based on domain or topic, then I think you're really going to be focusing on growth rate and this age of the actual papers, the age of most of the papers in the cluster itself, because that's really what's going to tell you what's new and how fast is it moving and therefore how quickly do I need to care about it. Hopefully that answers the question. If not, always happy to chat about that. Also, I will just throw out that there was an article published in PLOS, P-L-O-S, that was is specifically, the title is A Novel Approach to Predicting Exceptional Growth in Research. It was co-authored by Dick Clavins, Kevin Boyack, and Dewey Murdoch, the director of CSAT. And so these a lot of these approaches on the prediction have actually been tested and published. Um, so that is available if you want to Google that. It's PLOS is obviously open source and available. Yeah, and we have um, that that's linked through the documentation for the tool. And, and we, we actually, the map of science, there's a few different publications. Again, CSAT doesn't, we don't focus on sort of publications in that sense. But in this case, we do have a few describing various aspects of them, the clustering methodology prediction, um, as well as sort of how we um, sort of use models to subject classify um, different aggregations of literature. Um, so definitely recommend those. I've seen a few questions coming in about how um, ETO tools are financially supported, um, which again, very good questions. Um, so ETO is part of CSET's data team. We are funded out of CSET's operating budget. Um, CSET is 100% philanthropically funded. Um, our current donors are on CSET's website. Um, I am not going to list them for fear that I will mess it up, but please look there. Um, but yeah, that's basically we, um, CSED as, as a policy doesn't um, sort of, we don't take sort of task specific grants from government, for example, um, we don't uh, you know take uh, funding from corporations and that sort of thing. Um, so it's the same scenario as for CSED in general. Um, I will say we've been able to um, sort of create and put out these tools 
um, as ETO. I mean, ETO is a, a fairly sort of small organization within CSET, um, but we are really standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, we, are, we are taking advantage of what at this point has been a multi-year investment by CSET, again, with that philanthropic support into things like data infrastructure, data licensing and contracting. Um, really, I mean, often fairly costly, um, very specialized sort of work. Um, our hope is that we are kind of now making all that work useful beyond sort of the bounds of CSET for whom it was originally intended. Um, but we we do and we plan to sort of fund all that work the same way as CSET's analysis in general is the long and short of it. Um, sorry, that Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I've also seen a lot of questions coming in that are talking about kind of why one approach specifically rather than another. I just want to um, maybe build on something that John was saying as well um, and really kind of emphasize to you that CSAT doesn't look at this as a fully automated capital T truth. You, you, slap some filters up there, you get an answer, and then you don't think about it. You just accept automation as the answer. All of these tools should be used with as many kind of tools and as much expertise as you have to begin to guide you down a path to get better knowledge and understanding of an incredibly complex and dynamic space. So using keyword approaches have huge biases and problems. Citations have biases and problems. Um, every approach that you would use has biases and problems. The key is to know your biases and then to use these approaches in a complementary way along with expertise. So when I use this, I look at the clusters and then I dig into those titles of those of the primary articles, the core articles. I look at who the folks are and I'll sometimes even dig into what are the other things those people are publishing, right? I'll look at the difference between what the Chinese institutions are doing, what the US institutions are doing, what the German institutions are doing. Is there similarity? What you'll often see is that the similarity is around a problem, not necessarily a, a topic. So if I care about the topic more than what they're actually trying to use that thing to solve it, then I might go back and supplement this with keywords searching across different, different clusters. I may use the clusters to find keywords that I'll go back and use other approaches that are more keyword word based, right? I might use the clusters as a launch pad for that, or use a few keywords as a launch pad to find a few clusters that expand my keyword list. So I think what I would encourage folks to really embrace is that there is not a single way to use automation and data that you have available to you as a capital T truth of the entire world in emerging technology, right? This is all about beginning to give you more ways to understand this environment. Yeah, for sure. I think that's true. The map of science is certainly true. The supply chain explorer too. Um, I think I our highest goal, you know, is is um, giving people sort of a, a footing, like an orientation, and then really good entry points. Entry points that you can get at in a rigorous way that puts you in a productive direction for whatever other resources you might have at your fingertips. You know, if you have access to subject matter experts, use this tool to have a more productive conversation with them. If you're going into a room, you know, negotiating something related to one of these technologies, like use it to get smart, use it to be able to tell when, you know, someone's coming at you with an agenda and, and maybe a little more straightforward. Um, if you have access to sort of other data resources, you know, we have, um, for example, integration directly in the tool. I should have pointed this out earlier if I can find my tab. We have integration directly into the tool, into um, data sets such as Digital Science Dimensions, into Web of Science from Clarivate. Um, again, we're, we're pulling some metadata from those vendors into the tool and displaying it here, but you can get much more by sort of using it as a portal into those resources. And again, we are always happy to talk with folks about, you know, how can I, you know, these are my resources, this is my situation, how can I plug this in most effectively? And that's definitely how we think of it. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. I might actually combine a few on the supply chain explorer um, and, and ask for John's advice here. 
Um, so we have a few different questions about the sources of data for the supply chain explorer, sort of how, how, to, how to maintain the sort of understanding of the semiconductor supply chain ecosystem. Um, and I think it's interesting to get at this because it is in some ways the very opposite, or I won't say the very opposite, it's very different from bibliometric data where we have, you know, really excellent public domain sources, really excellent vendors, and we're able to sort of build infrastructure on top of that. Um, the data that feeds the supply chain explorer has been developed, um, I think, with the blood and sweat and tears of a lot of CSET analysts over the past few years. Um, every data point, you know, wh whether it's the textual descriptions or the listings of notable supplier companies, every data point um, in this tool has already been published in a CSET paper, um, with very, very few exceptions. Um, when we, we have done a little bit of enrichment on the company side and a little bit of sort of um, checking to make sure everything's up to date since the papers were published. But it really is, it's developed from a wide variety of sources. Some of those are commercial data sets um, that you know CSET has licensed again for our own analytic purposes. Um, but that really have to be um, you know what you see in the tool is is sort of there. It takes a lot of interpretation and processing from from sort of the the form that vendors are providing it. In a lot of other cases, it's you know open news. Um, it's every type of source you can think of, and it does take. Um, an analyst to make sense of it and turn it into a, a, a format that, that makes sense. Um, so this tool, um, again, one of the reasons it's at a high level is because we weren't confident we could keep it updated if it was that much more granular. And it will be updated on a more periodic cycle than the map of science, for example. Um, but John, I think this is an interesting question because it gets, I mean, like, a lot of people in CSET's orbit are now very, like, looking really hard for like good actionable information on semiconductors, the semiconductor supply chain. Um, and I know there's a lot of interesting policy initiatives around that too. Um, I mean, just what do you think is gonna be needed to, um, or what do you hope to emerge in this information space over the next few years, whether it's from ETO or someone else that can kind of better orient US policy on this topic? I think it would be a great outcome if, you're able to use the map of science to predict some sort of innovation in the semiconductor industry in the same way that certain things have happened over the past few decades in the chip industry that had some indications beforehand. So uh, currently to make leading edge logic chips in particular, we use a FinFET architecture, which was actually the result of some innovation funded by DARPA about 15 years ago initially. And that started to be manifest in publications and patent filings and the sort of signals that we've talked about a lot today. And so to the extent that the information being collected in the Map of Science and Supply Chain Explorer can be used to predict something that we'll see come out commercially in the industry in the next 5, 10, 15 years, that to me would be a really powerful value add. It's uh, goals for us in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we are we are at time, unfortunately. I know there's um, a bunch of other questions, a, a lot of them fairly technically focused. What I will say is if you asked a, a question that you're still that we didn't get to um, and you still want to know the answer, um, please email it to CSET underscore ETO at Georgetown um, or to me directly. I believe my contact information is available on CSET's website. Um, we respond to those emails and I uh, we will definitely get back to you. Um, and to be honest, um, questions and feedback about um, sort of the the tech, whether it's the technical aspects or or sort of the broader um, orientation of of the tools um, goes directly into our development process again because it shows this is what people want to know in order to be using this tool in their work. Um, so please follow up if we were not able to get to your questions. Really appreciate um, all of the often very detailed questions about what we're up to. Um, it says to me we might we might have a an interested user pool for this stuff, which is which is the dream. But um, that's about the end of our time. So for now, I guess I'll turn it back over to Lynn uh, with again, a big thanks to everyone for for coming out and for your interest in what we're doing here. Yes, thank you, Zach, for being such a capable uh, moderator, but also as the lead analyst of ETO. I think you and your team have a lot to be proud of here. I also want to thank Melissa Flagg and John Verway for being panelists, as well as uh, consulting with CSET on a variety of projects. 
Thanks too to everyone else for joining us today. Your comments and questions were really engaging. We're sorry we couldn't get to them all. Once again, if you're interested in following up uh, directly, you can send an email to et csat underscore eto at georgetown.edu. If you'd like to learn more about CSAT, please go to csat.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and research updates. And keep an eye out for news about our next tech and security event taking place in January. Until then, here's wishing you a happy and healthy holiday season. Thanks all. <laughs>